Chapter 4 The Great Train Robbery In the early hours of August 8, 1963, the night mail train from Glasgow to London's King's Cross Station was making good time. But for the driver, 58-year-old Jack Mills, and his assistant, 26-year-old David Whitby, this would be a night they would remember for the rest of their lives. Mills, especially, would always be a sick man, and indeed would die young, after what was about to happen. Nearly all the train's twelve coaches were used as offices for the Royal Mail, for sorting the letters and packets into groups for different towns and cities. One special coach, for valuable packets, was carrying 128 bags of old money. The money was old banknotes, which were on their way to the Royal Mint, the place where banknotes are made, to be destroyed. At 3.03 a.m., almost 80 kilometers from London, and near the small village of Cheddington, Jack Mills suddenly saw a red signal. He immediately brought his engine to a stop. It was unusual to find a red signal here, so David Whitby got out of the engine to walk to the emergency telephone, which was behind a signal box. But two men in black balaclava helmets, later known to be Buster Edwards and Bob Welsh, came out of the darkness and pushed him down on the ground at the side of the railway. One man told Whitby, If you shout, I'll kill you. Two men climbed into the engine, and Jack Mills tried to fight them. One of the men hit Mills over the head. Meanwhile, others in the gang quietly and efficiently unfastened the ten sorting coaches at the back of the train, leaving just the front two fastened to the engine. The valuable packets coach was the second of these. David Whitby was brought back, and the robbers made Jack Mills drive the train very slowly to Bredego Bridge, six hundred meters down the railway. They left the other ten coaches behind. The seventy sorters still working inside them did not realize what was happening. Other gang members, wearing balaclavas and army uniforms, were waiting at the bridge with Land Rovers and a three-ton army lorry. They had tied something white to a stick by the railway to mark the place where they wanted the engine to stop. They broke the windows of the valuable packets coach and made the post office sorters lie down on the floor. Next, the robbers passed 120 bags of old banknotes out into the darkness. Fifteen minutes later, the train robbers put handcuffs on Mills and Whitby and warned them not to try to escape for at least half an hour. Then, leaving eight bags behind, they disappeared into the night. The robbery had taken a total of twenty-four minutes. The 120 mailbags contained 2.5 million pounds in old notes. Today, that would be about 25 million pounds, and at the time, it was the biggest robbery ever. The newspapers were soon calling it the crime of the century, and the post office quickly offered 10,000 pounds for information that would lead to the arrest of the robbers. How did the robbers change the railway signal from go to stop was one of the first things detectives wanted to know. They soon had the answer. The robbers had covered the green go signal with a glove, then used their own red light which they had brought with them. But where were they now? Weeks before, the gang had bought an old farmhouse called Leatherslade Farm, about fifty kilometers from the bridge. They went there after the robbery to count their money. Each man would get more than 150,000 pounds. They had planned to stay at the farmhouse for four days, but during the afternoon of Thursday, August 8th, they heard something on the radio news that made them change their plans. Buckinghamshire police announced that they were sure the gang were hiding not more than 50 kilometers from Bredego Bridge. In fact, the police were only guessing this because Mills and Whitby had been told not to try to get help for 30 minutes. The gang would have needed longer than this to go more than 50 kilometers to a hiding place. The gang left Leatherslade Farm on Friday, August 9th. 
By the following Monday, the police had found the farmhouse where they were hiding. Inside were post office mailbags. Before long, detectives had found the fingerprints of several people in the gang, some of whom were well known criminals Bruce Reynolds, Buster Edwards, Ronnie Biggs, Bob Welch, Roy James, John Daly, and Charlie Wilson. Now began the job of finding them. Roger Cordray, who had fixed the railway signal to show red instead of green, and Bill Bowl, another of the robbers, tried to find a garage for their van in Bournemouth. But they picked the wrong person to ask. The owner of the garage was the widow of a policeman, and she immediately suspected something when the robbers paid her from a thick packet of banknotes. She phoned the police while the two men were putting their van into the garage. The police caught them and found seventy-eight thousand eight hundred ninety-two pounds in the van. More of the money was found in four suitcases in a wood in Surrey on August 16th. Then another thirty thousand pounds was discovered in the ceiling of a caravan parked near the wood. By the end of the year, most of the gang had been caught. Charlie Wilson was arrested without any trouble at his Clapham home. Roy James was more difficult to catch. He was hiding in a house in St. John's Wood in North London. But when he saw the police, James took a bag containing twelve thousand pounds and climbed up onto the roof to try and escape. He jumped and ran along neighbors' roofs, but more than forty policemen were in the surrounding streets. And James finally jumped down into the waiting arms of one of them. John Daly was arrested the same day. Buster Edwards, Bruce Reynolds, and Jimmy White were still missing. And so was two million pounds. The trial of the others began on January 24, 1964, at Aylesbury in Buckinghamshire. The police did not want the trial to take place at the Old Bailey. The famous London criminal court, because they were afraid powerful London criminals might frighten people on the jury. All the prisoners were tried together, and all but Roger Cordray pleaded not guilty. The trial took two months. Neither Jack Mills or David Whitby could be sure which had been the men behind the balaclavas, and nobody had seen the robbers at the farm. But the lawyers brought in a total of two hundred witnesses. The judge took six days to talk to the jury, and the jury took two days to decide that all the robbers except John Daly were guilty. The guilty men were sent to prison for up to thirty years. Jimmy White was finally caught in Dover on the south coast of England. Police suspected that he was trying to get abroad. Buster Edwards gave himself up in 1966, and Bruce Reynolds, the leader of the gang, was finally caught in 1968. He was arrested in Torquay, in Devon, and was sent to jail for 25 years. Two of the gang were not in jail for long. In August 1964, Charlie Wilson escaped from Birmingham's Winson Green Prison when three men broke into the prison to release him even though prison officers were watching him carefully because they suspected that he was a person likely to try to escape. In July 1965, Ronnie Biggs got out of Wandsworth Prison with three other prisoners while they were walking between the prison buildings. The four men climbed the six-meter prison wall using a rope ladder, which had been thrown down by one member of an escape gang outside. Charlie Wilson went to France and Mexico after his escape, but was finally caught again in Canada in 1967. Ronnie Biggs finally went to live in Brazil after first escaping to Australia. He is still there, living in Rio de Janeiro with his girlfriend, Raimunda Castro, and their child. There is nothing that English lawyers or the English police can do about it. In 1993, Biggs said that four gang members were never caught. Nobody, other than the robbers and possibly a few other criminals, knows who they are.